Hello, Bangalore. Welcome. As you walked into this campus, this marvelous, um, modern, green, clean campus, did you see, feel a sense of pride? Pride in Bangalore's achievement, pride in India's achievement. But if you are like me, somewhere deep in your heart, you also worry. Okay? Are we sort of sitting in this bubble and looking around us, and kind of seeing this warped reality in which a billion plus people in India live? Um, is India's prosperity real or is it a mirage? Okay? This is the question that we set out to answer. Um, we, I mean my colleagues at National Council of Applied Economic Research and University of Maryland. We uh, carried out a large household survey called India Human Development Survey. You know, for me personally, this journey began when I realized that India has this wonderful statistical system for the last 50 years, but we tend to focus on sort of a, a macro level phenomenon. You know, people don't live poverty rates, they don't live work participation rates, they live their hopes, fears, dreams, angst, tears. So how do we know what's happening in people's lives? Is a person who is born poor destined to be poor all his life? Um, how, do, how do people manage with poverty? Who do they go to when a husband falls sick? When a daughter is falling behind in school, do parents pull her out and put that money in educating the son? Or do they use uh, that um, extra money to give her private tutoring? Why is it that even after 60 years after independence, we still have uh, this massive protests from Jats, Gurjars, Patidars for reservations? These are the kind of questions that we wanted to answer when we undertook this survey, India Human Development Survey. The problem with India is, of course, that everything is simultaneously true and false. There is enormous poverty in one corner, there is enormous wealth in another corner, and sometimes they exist side by side. So in order to study this, and in order to understand what's happening to a majority of Indian populations, we went to, visited roughly over 41,000 households. We talked to men, women, and children covering data on more than 200,000 individuals. Uh, our interviewers carried out interviews in 12 different languages, many different um, uh, dialects. And we are deeply grateful to our respondents for opening their homes and their hearts to us and talking to us not just once, but twice and without a single rupee of compensation. So what did we find? Okay. First thing we found was that about 37% of the people we visited in the second round of interview in 2011-12 told us that they were better off than they were in the first round of interview, which was in 2004-05. This is really heartening and it is borne out by their economic status and material well-being. Poverty rates fell sharply between these two surveys from 38% to 21%. Material possessions grew. You won't be surprised to hear that cell phone ownership grew from 7% to 78% over just this seven year period. Ownership of color TV grew from 24% to 56%. But, if there was a change in people's incomes and material lives, there was a massive change in their aspirations. Everyone knows that India is doing better. They just want their share, their own share of that pie. And if they can't get it for themselves, they want it for their children. Okay? And the best way of getting it is to making sure that these children get education. And so they send their children to school. If they can afford it, they send them to this beautiful private uh, convent school. If they can't afford it, they will send them to government schools. They will send them to rural schools. Okay? But send them to schools, they will. That is the major change that has taken place. There was a time when we used to think that India's backwardness is because of lack of literacy. 
you know, we won't be able to say that. More than 95% of the children today go in school. Virtually every child is in school. This is for children under 15. Even children 15 to 18, there is a massive increase in enrollment level. Today, more than 70% of children 15 to 18 are in school, either in secondary school or in college. That is a tremendous change. However, along with this change, we have also faced many, many challenges. And this is where the issue of mindset comes in. Let me describe some of the challenges. Okay, parents of all caste, creed, um, forward caste, Dalits, Adivasis, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians send their kids to school. As you can see in this graph, every social group has their children in school for children under 14. Okay? But not all children learn at the equal rate. If you can look at this, this is showing proportion of children who can read a simple paragraph, a class one level text. And you can see the massive difference between the forward caste and Adivasis, 68% to 40%. How does this difference occur? I mean, teaching a child to read a simple paragraph is not a great skill. Somewhere along the line, our schools are leaving some children behind. What's happening? Can we blame just the schools and teachers? Or is there something happening in the wider society as a whole? And I'd like to suggest that India still remains mired in a social structure that focuses on caste, kin network, family, and that sort of spills over in uh, the way we treat everyone else. We somehow make other people sort of other out there and focus on people who are close to us. You know, you sit around in Bombay and say, oh, look, look, this is a liberal propaganda. Uh, it is activist propaganda. Caste doesn't matter anymore. Not so. What we did was we asked households, how many of you uh, practice untouchability in some form? Okay? You'll be surprised to hear that 20% of the households said yes. For people who said no, we asked them, okay, so would there be a problem if some Dalit were to come in your kitchen and use your utensils? And a further 7% said, no, 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 that wouldn't be accepted. Now, remember, this is a sensitive question. The remaining 73% who say we don't practice untouchability, there are probably some of them who still do. Okay. Now, you know, sometimes I wonder, how do we still maintain caste in the modern world? And I think one of the biggest um, reasons we are able to maintain caste and kin boundaries is that all our social relationships spring from that. Marriage in particular is something that sort of ties us together. We asked in 2004, five women, um, what proportion uh, of women had arranged marriage? 41% said our parents arranged the marriage. A further 55% said, my parents are in the marriage, but my input was asked. Nonetheless, it was an arranged marriage. What we call today love marriage or self-choice is barely 5%. Fast forward to 2012, and the results are almost identical. No difference. Okay? Thus, marriage is something that sort of ties families, caste, kin group together. It also creates a network that is wonderful for people who come from privileged backgrounds. You know, it's wonderful to be able to call up your cousin and say, oh, my son needs a job. Is there an opening in your company? But what if you come from a background where your cousin is not in such a high position? And this is where people's um, mindset needs to be changed. It's not the government who can make a change. It's the way we think. We need to start thinking about equal opportunity for everyone. So the next time your cousin calls you up for a job for one of his relatives, please think about someone who doesn't have a cousin in such a wonderful position. Now, if government's mindset, if in people's mindset is stuck in a rut, government's mindset is in a deep, deep ditch. How many people in this room are old enough to remember the Garibi Hatao slogan of Indira Gandhi? Well, this just shows how uh, young India is. Uh, most of these people in this room are under 40. 
But you know, the slogans have changed. Um, policies and government attitude underlying this um, uh, Garibi Hatao or social safety net programs has not changed. Even today, what we tend to do is, we tend to identify uh, people who are poor, they come from poor areas, poor families, um, Dalits from poor uh, districts, and provide them with something called below poverty line card. And that BPL card is the ticket to getting um, subsidized food, scholarships, housing benefits, and so on, which is all well and good. If poverty were stagnant, but we are talking about a country in which the eco economy is rapidly improving, and the person who was poor today is not going to be poor in two, four, six, ten years. And if we give out this card every 10 or actually in reality every 15 years, okay, we are going to uh, somehow miss target our benefits. Let me show you some data. Okay? So this is of the 100% who were in our survey in 2005. 38% were poor or 38 people were poor in 2005 and 62% were not poor. Of this, 25 people moved out of poverty by the time it was 2012. 13 still remained poor. Of the people who were not poor, nine became poor and 53 remained not poor. So what's happening is that in 2012, we have this 22 poor of that nine would not have a BPL card if the BPL card was handed out seven years ago. That is 40%. Okay? So these 40% really don't get the benefits they should be getting. In contrast, the other 25% uh, people who should, uh, who have a BPL card really don't need it. Okay? So in some sense, what we are doing is not only are we mistargeting our benefits, uh, we are also leaving out people who really need it. In some ways, our philosophy has really been uh, structured around accident of life. We think that people are poor because they are born in poor families, they come from poor areas, and hence, let's give them benefits. We haven't focused on accident of life. We don't focus on people where a husband dies and wife has to somehow survive. Um, someone has a tuberculosis and suddenly there are huge medical expenses. A cow dies, there is a drought, there is some sort of a crop loss. Okay? These kinds of accidents of life, we don't have any way of addressing or at least not addressing systematically. So what can we do? Okay? Here the issue is really to think about what's been happening in the rest of the world. US where um, a 2008 recession has fueled middle-class rage. That's an interesting example. Latin America, where incomes have been growing up, suddenly has started focusing on vulnerability rather than the poverty. And we need to start thinking about some of these issues and think in terms of health insurance, crop insurance, um, life insurance, employment, short-term employment program, for um, poor, particularly the urban poor, uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme already provides some sort of a support for the rural poor. Provision of hostels and scholarships so the educational expenditures don't really deplete the resources. These are the kinds of accidents of life against which we need some sort of social safety net. So as India gets richer, we don't need to leave the poor behind, but we do need to change our policies about and our thinking and our mindset about who is poor and what kind of policies we need to address. In the ending, let me just tell you a story about a young girl and her father whom I interviewed in Jabalpur. The father comes from scheduled caste. He has completed 12th standard of education and he wanted to get a government job. He couldn't get one. So now he works as a low level general contractor. He is determined that his 15 year old daughter is going to pass the Indian Administrative Services exam and become an elite IAS officer. The daughter is committed, the father is committed. But we don't really know whether they will be able to make it. Will there be some sort of um, um, a health problem in the family and the girl will have to be pulled out? Will the school actually prepare this Dalit girl to pass this exam? These are the challenges that this young girl faces. 
these are the challenges India faces. Thank you.